I'm going to give you all my secrets right now. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold the phone. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. That's Melissa Chadburn, but we'll get to her in a moment. First, some housekeeping while I have your undivided attention. This is not a paid advertisement. Some of you may or may not subscribe to the lit journal Creative Nonfiction. I know I do. I am proud to announce that I have an essay in the current winter issue, number 62. A themed issue on joy, unexpected brightness in dark times. My essay is titled, get ready for it, The Gentleman's Guide to Arousal-Free Slow Dancing. That's right. We're going back to middle school for my 8th grade dinner dance. But it's not just mine you should be thrilled to read. There's Brian Doyle, Lee Gutkin, Angela Palm, Leah Kaminsky, Laura Hagen, and many, many more gracing this issue. So buy it up and read our shit. Okay, back to the show. It's episode 33 of Hashtag CNF. You know, I'm your host, Brendan O'Mara. Thank you for listening. My guest is Melissa Chadburn, at Melissa Chadburn on Twitter, an L.A.-based writer who was the second runner-up in Proximity Magazine's inaugural Narrative Journalism Prize in the fall of 2016. The title of the piece is The Readiness Assessment, link in the show notes, and details the state of foster care in and around Los Angeles. Melissa lived through it herself, so the essay is wrought with authority. So um, without further ado, let's just get to it. Here's Melissa Chadburn. Thank you. Very nice. So how do you define a successful day of work for you? Uh, wow, that's a really good question. Um Cause it's like, uh, I don't, uh, I guess words on the page is nice, but, um, you can have just like a bunch of crap words on the page. I think it's like this internal compass. I often have this idea of what a successful day would look like for me when I get up. And that includes some sort of way to get the blood moving, some running or, walking and then and then uh some listening or reading and then some writing um and then for whatever reason I might just like abandon myself and my plans and throw all those out the wayside like I couldn't possibly allow myself to do those things so um but you know every now and again the image in my mind aligns with what I actually do and and that, I think, is a successful working day for me. So yesterday, for example, I've been struggling with this scene that I'm working on. And um, my novel, a good part of my novel, takes place in um, Canada, in uh, Port Quitlam, Canada. And, um, you know, living in Los Angeles, it's hard to capture that sort of swampy coldness. And um, I got in my car and I went up the, I drove like 20 minutes up the Angeles Crest Highway and I found myself in this diner and there was all this snow there. Um, (laughs) And it was magical. And I might've just written like, actually I probably just wrote uh, like a thousand words, but it was a successful writing day for me just because I was able to capture what I wanted to on the page and pursue what I wanted to. Great. And I'm, I'm huge on morning routines and how people jumpstart their mind and, and kind of get that stuff going. And I, I wonder, how do you start your day? Like right from the moment you wake up um, and how do, how do you sort of warm up, uh, warm yeah. up the mind and, and even the body? Yeah, I, um, I have a hopefully if, if it if all works out, like what I would like to do and what I normally try to do is I get up and I, um, with my coffee every morning, I do a daily journal because most of my writing is observing. And so every morning I list seven things. I, hey, I, I list seven things I saw the day before 
seven things I did the day before. I write one thing that I overheard somebody say, and I draw something that I saw. And that's like usually so. And it, um, when you start doing it, you realize like, oh man, I don't see anything, and I don't do anything. Like you can't like list seven television shows you watched, or you know, <laughs> or you can, but you feel kind of like lame about it. And so, um, <laughs> I, it, it, in a way, it sort of encourages me to be observant. And then I also, I do try to notice, you know, some of the more minor things and, and clocking them the following day actually really, uh, helps my memory. That's, that's pretty cool. Cause that gives you like this, a, a great catalog of everything that's going on. And it's, uh, it, I suspect that if you want to go back and maybe write about something or just, I don't, you just want to know what you did on a certain day. It just really, it kind of like brings that day to the to the forefront. You can really remember it vividly, even uh, after some time has passed. So that's a really cool exercise. Yeah, and then also I it can it I can somehow and it, sometimes you can string them together and realize, uh, and that is its own piece. Like if I didn't if I didn't take out the trash, I wouldn't have seen that dead bird. Um, so how do you stay focused on your work? It's easy, as you know, like as artists, sometimes it can be easy to just go get distracted and f mm -hmm. you just find uh, go into corners that you that aren't productive. And I wonder uh, how you choose to stay. What practices you employ to kind of stay on track? Man, well, deadlines mm -hmm. is really <laughs> what it is. Um, I uh, and also um, I treat it. You know, it it's my job, so. I treat it as such, you know, if I want to eat, I have to write, but I also do, um, I do have to reconcile that I have a lot. I often have a lot of ideas and, um, I often, and it's, and especially when you're writing, when I'm writing nonfiction or even doing a piece of investigative journalism, or um, uh, oftentimes I, I genre jump or do something that's sort of like a, a blend of the two. Um, so, uh, you know, when you're doing research, it's really easy to fall down multiple rabbit holes. And, um, and, and it, it's a balance between also guarding my heart about being super excited about uh, an assignment or a story Um if, because it's possible that I won't be able to pursue it. And then also um, editing and pairing back my ideas. Cause sometimes I expect, I want like one particular piece to tell all the stories or I try to switch, scrunch everything in one thing. And I have to realize like, Oh, this is the, you know, I will write again. I can't put, I have to put it all in one piece. I goal set. I have, um, I'm really lucky. I have a, a crew of, a community that I work with. Um, some friends started this organization called women who submit encouraging women to submit their work for publication. And we have, um, submission parties where we come together and we set submission goals and, um, hit send together. And so, that helps. Um, and we try to just like make it fun and encourage, like every time somebody hits send, we clap and we encourage them. And it, it kind of makes me want to do that for everything that might be feel like a little bit of a drag, like have fill paying parties and, <laughs> you know, but, um, so that helps me stay on track. Um, I also share work with people so to make sure that to get some feedback and get other eyes on it before I pitch it. Why is it important to submit work and ship it? Oh, yeah. Um, that's like, that's most of the thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, 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 it's funny. I, um, I often hear from, and the reason why we started Women Who Submit was to address the inequity in publishing um, amongst uh the, the gender inequity in publishing, um, specifically. And, um, I often hear from people, you know, Hey, can you help me, um, get my work to submit it? Or even as an editor, I often see work and, and it's not so much that women aren't 
necessarily submitting the first time, but they're not resubmitting. So if an, if an editor says, hey, we really like this, but it's not a perfect fit, but send something else, I don't always get people sending something else, it, most often with women. And so, uh, and people ask me for advice all the time on how to get their work published. And then when I suggest that they submit, they're like, oh, I can never do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, well, how is it going to get published? <laughs> I'll never submit it. So, I mean, I think it is, um, I do think that there is, you need to balance your time between um, being a writer and, and being a spectator and being generative and submitting your work for publication. But I definitely think it should be at least, you know, 20% of my practice. So when the, when uh, when people come to you for advice, what do you, what do you tell them? Yeah, well, I mean, I my own publishing story was um, born out of uh, I I was I just remember very clearly I worked for a long time in labor and I organized um, I or I was working organizing unorganizing unorganized industries or working with uh, representing the rights of of workers in low-wage industries. And at one point in time, I was staying at an extended stay in America in Santa Rosa, California. And um, uh, and uh, it was like a really shady place. And uh, it was there were a lot of people that were like living in the extended stay in America as their primary residence. Um, and uh, and my dog, I, luckily I got to bring my dog with me, but I got dumped over the phone. Oh. And... I just decided this I'm no longer just some a woman living in this podunk town in the extended state of America. I am officially on a writer's retreat. And I decided to take everything I learned from organizing a work site to and apply it to my submission protocol. So instead of doing a scattershot approach, meaning sending one story here and one story there. I took one story and I submitted it to 100 different publications um, that I knew that I was familiar with, you know, and um, and uh, and 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 then I end up, you know, getting published. So I just decided to take what I knew about organizing a workplace to to how to get my work out there in the world. And then I learned that um, then I learned that that uh, if I refer to an editor by name and if I refer to a specific piece that resonated with me that increased my response my personal response by like a, a great deal and so I, I that's usually what I encourage people to do is to to um, be strategic about their submission process yeah that's uh, that's incredibly uh, like industrious that approach you had. Uh, I think when people think that they e either they're submitting query letters or actual stories, um, they think they're submitting to a lot of places, but in reality, they are completely not. And like you said, you submitted a story to a hundred places, mm -hmm. and uh, instead of say like five, and you know, the people who might submit to five wonder why a piece of work isn't landing. But the fact of the matter is. You know, a tree makes a lot of seeds with only a couple taking root. So it's like you gotta, you've gotta spread, you gotta spread the love in a lot of ways in order to get to, to get the, to see your work in print or you know or online or something. So I wonder, yeah. yeah. So like, how did you figure that that you needed to really be aggressive in terms of that? That well, I just realized it's a numbers game. Yeah. You know, I mean, and what what I was doing was I was sending one five different stories to maybe five different magazines or journals, you know, as opposed to the same story across the board. And, and I also developed, uh, you know, a submission chart and I, now I, I, I mean, it's not for everybody, but I use a tiered system and, um, I set goals for myself like each year I want to break into a different tier and, um, and so that's how, and so I'm, I'm like incredibly strategic now on how I submit my work. And how do you define a tier? What do you mean by so, that? So, yeah, I mean, it's not as clean as it used to be because uh, it used to be based on readership. And since online magazines are available, it's, you know, that changes. And I base the readership 
um, on the CLMP listing. But um, so, but, but, but basically, you know, there are your tier zero, which are like the game changers that change your career. And then there's tier one. Um, and it's not like a hard and fast, but uh, I based it on, on former tier ratings and leader readership. And sometimes it's those that um, end up getting prizes the most or, you know, and so what does uh, COMP mean? Uh, C- oh, it's like, a, I don't remember what it stands for, but it's basically a registry of literary journals. Okay. So what is your, what has been your proudest, uh, proudest moment so far in your, in your publishing career? Oh man. That is so tough. I mean, I've been, it's so tough, but it's a really good question to think of now in the beginning of the year, because it's like, I'm, I've been really fortunate and, um, and I also am always aware of where I'm falling short, you know, so Mm. (laughs) like that ego is there all the time. But, um, but, uh, I, I mean, I get to work today with somebody who I have have always admired and um that has been really exciting. Like I so I had studied the work of uh Barbara Ehrenreich for a long time and um I was a real fan of um her mind and um her capacity to to do the work she does. I mean she used to so basically, um, Barbara Ehrenreich used to have to write about hosiery and makeup for money, and then she got this assignment for Harper's on um, tipped workers, and uh, that ended up becoming this book called Nickel and Dimed, and it was about the she lived uh, as a, a tipped worker for some time and wrote about it, and um, it was a really influential book, and uh, and so I. I pitched her because she started this project called the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, which um, was a nonprofit journalism effort uh, to pay uh, writers, emerging journalists, to write about issues of economic hardship. And she was also finding that that they sometimes they uh, these journals they you know helicopter out these journalists to write about uh, issues of whether it be um, worker struggles or, or any other type of economic hardship as opposed to the people that are experiencing it. So I, she approached me to write a piece and I did, and it was about, um, nonprofits, uh, pushing resilience, uh, upon, um, poverty in in impoverished neighborhoods and communities. And, um, and, uh, and it, it did really well. And so they ended up giving me a fellowship and hiring me as their community editor. So now I get to work with her on a consistent basis. And so that's a really exciting thing. And then I found the other day, I found uh, something that I had written when I was a child. I don't have very many of the things that I wrote when I was a child because um, as my piece in proximity says, like I, I grew up in foster care and I found this, I, when I was a kid, I used to write all these fake books. Like I would um, take, well, I don't know, fake, but well, I would take paper and, and draw lines on them and, and write these books. And I would even do like a fake, I would draw a cover and a, a little copyright symbol. And, <laughs> um, and I found the like bio of one of my books that I wrote. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, they were like, you know, of course, they're very complicated narratives about Alyssa Milano and I being best friends and, uh, <laughs> you know, and me going to a Madonna concert and, or so that, you know, it was like, uh, um, but I, I found the bio and it was like, I, I'm a young girl with divorced parents and I hope to be famous one day. That's <laughs> what I had written. Um, and, uh, and I, got to take that 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 fake bio and send it to my fancy 
real agent <laughs> this last year <laughs> when they sold my book. And so that was really exciting. Um, so uh, every day is, uh, I think, like a dream come true. And I think in lots of respects, like, I mean, for me, for someone like me, well, you know, growing up for me, like, a, I thought I thought vacuum cleaners were like luxury items. You know, we, we always had to sweep the carpet. And so, mm-hmm. um, I, I, you know, I, to be able to be a writer, like the people where I come from didn't, weren't, you know, authors they weren't published writers um so be able to do that for my career my job and to be able to teach it's like this twin feeling of one you know I'm incredibly lucky and then this other feeling of like well it's actually not a luxury you know because these are my weapons of choice and that's how I've survived for so long and then there's also this thing of like you know I'm I'm because of the way I've grown up I'm prepared for struggle and strife but it's I was never prepared for like having my dreams come true I mean that is like the most awkward feeling in the world Hmm. (laughs) when did you know you wanted to be a writer always always I mean I've always written Mm -hmm. like I said I used to write like I would write Ramona Quimby sequels or you know I would uh, and so I always did. And, and then I also had to, I was a very precocious reader. And so when I was in school, uh, we would have to do book reports and I, I was reading like Jackie Collins novels and I couldn't possibly do a book report on, you know, Hollywood wives or the bitch or something. So I, I did fake, I would write fake book reports about fake books that I made up like Susie wins the big race or something a little bit more appropriate. And, um, so I always wanted to be a writer. And how has your definition of what it means to be successful changed over the last 10 to 15 years? I think, you know, I guess, yeah, because, well, I know that I, I always change, like I said, I have a tiered submission process. So that is a really strategic way for me to look at success too, in terms of like, oh, I broke into another tiered journal or something like that. So that's one way for success to look. Um, But, you know, I'm also like incredibly ambitious. And um, so at one point, I think I told my friend, um, being a writer is like you're always in the hallway. So you're always, you know, there used to be like this. Uh, sometimes we have a saying like, like when one door closes, another window opens, but being in the hallway sucks. <laughs> but also like when you're a writer, you're always in the hallway, except, you know, the, some of the, the hallways are nicer than others. Some of the doors are nicer than others. Like, you know, you can open a door and you're in a fancier hallway than you were before. But, like, that, I just need to, like, settle in and accept, like, my whole career I'm going to be in one hallway or another. You know, um, I had my first book deal, you know, but but perhaps I would have wanted to have a better advance. You know, um, now we have to figure out what that the sales are going to look like. And so, you know, if I, if those sales on your first book aren't so hot, then, you know, you're going to be worried about like getting your second book deal or whatever, you know? So there's always going to be that one thing or another to strive for. You're always going to be in one hallway or another. How do you, how do you uh, manage the, the, the things that can be toxic to writers is often like comparing yourself to somebody else. And that can be, you know, someone got mm-hmm. access to this publisher or had a better advance and, or has more readers. I mean, the list goes on and on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wonder how do you stay focused and run your own race? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm really lucky because uh, my background is – like I said, in, in organizing workers and working within the labor movement. And so I'm very conscious of this thing of like my whole, the way I approach thing, uh, things is like, I'm not like, man, how the fuck did he get that thing? And I didn't get that thing. I'm like, Oh, if he could get that thing, then I could possibly get that mm. thing. Like it, it opens up a possibility. And I am always sort of, I am competing against myself in the past. 
as opposed to other people. So I am, by running my own race, I guess, I mean, I am competing against myself. I mean, but sure, it's tempting, though, to, like, look to see what's going on on the other side of the street. Um, and uh, I also, I do, you know, I did have to learn how to negotiate, too. I mean, in terms of pay and things like that, like, I had to, I have, I've had to tell people, like, hey, you know, um, I don't mind, I understand if you don't have that much money, but don't let me find out that other people are getting paid more than I am, you know, mm. or, or I've had to ask people if they could do better when they've given me job offers before. So, yeah, I mean, again, I'm always I'm trying to set goals for myself um, and, uh, and compete against myself. So what other artistic media do you consume to help inform the writing you do? I'm a big fan of being a witness. So uh, I don't think it's necessarily artistic media, but I consume a lot of, um, I consume a lot of data. <laughs> so <laughs> that sounds like the least sexy thing to look at, but it's, <laughs> really interesting and there's a reason why people are so protective of data and there's a reason why um why it's uh, a lot of people's you know their main commodity i mean that's that's their their gold is the data so i look at a lot of data i mean i i mean uh for example right now i'm um i'm working on a piece on uh child fatalities within los angeles of kids that have been uh, interfaced with the child welfare system. So I'm, I'm looking at like a lot of coroner's reports and, um, and crap, stuff like that. Mm. How do you go about obtaining that kind of information? I have to uh, file requests. <laughs> like, so, for, like freedom of information? Well, it's just or... like so for L.A., it's local. So there, in California, there's a law called SB 39, meaning if there was a fatality and it was by the hands of the primary caretaker and there was DCFS involvement, then then I'm privy to that information. So I have to just know the law and quote it, mm. basically. So what writers have influenced your style? Well, uh, I'm a big fan of Joyce Carol Oates. I would say Joyce Carol Oates. I would say um, I've heard Sapphire. Um, I've and then uh, so I think they've been big influences. Um, other people like on the nonfiction side. I'm gonna mess up his name. <laughs> I don't know if it, it's James Ag. I always say Aggie, but everybody. I think you're right. Ag. It's Ag. Yeah, so. that's how I've. That's how I learned his name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at least we're we're on the same page. We'll say yeah. James Ag. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I would say James Ag, and uh, but man, I mean, I like I'm a, I've been reading a lot lately. So, uh, I, usually whatever whoever I read last, like I've been reading a lot of Byron Dutty Roy's work lately. So. She's now influencing me while we talk. And I, I got to I got to say, your the the piece that you submitted and was a second runner up in the proximity contest, the readiness assessment. I was just so moved by the piece, the the personal stuff and and the the other the factual stuff, the data that, that you were alluding to that you're able to pull into it. And it was such a just a like a wonderful like heart-wrenching but just a, a very really moving story and i just want to like first just kind of like thank you for writing it in the first place so well done oh thank you and i have to say that maggie was such a cool editor to work with because you know a lot of people i've pitched that piece other places and a lot of people were like it's not one thing or another so they didn't know what to do with it you know they're like that that's why it was so much fun. To, that whole contest was so much fun because it was a genre bending contest. So it's like, I, I love being able to participate in something that was, um, you know, both factual and lyrical. 
And how did you come to that piece? How did you arrive at it and decide to write about it in the in the way you chose to? Mm-hmm. And it, you're you're someone who writes fiction and nonfiction, so I think some people might uh, uh, might choose to go in a different direction, but you choose to really take this one head on in the in the fact department. So I want like I just want kind of know your thought process and how you arrived at the at the story the way you chose to write it. Yeah, I mean, with all nonfiction, you know, you kind of need something to hang your narrative on. And I do find I'm going to give you all my secrets right now. Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) But it's just because but I do find documents a really interesting thing to hang your narrative on. Like, I think it's a really great way to hang your narrative on a great thing to hang your narrative on. Um And so, you know, like with the readiness assessment, I had this tool that I was interfacing with. Like I said, data is my thing. And so I had this tool that I was looking at all the time and I thought, oh, well, that's an interesting thing. Like, because also I find these tools to be pretty arbitrary. Usually whenever I come across a document of a survey or something like that, it's always like, a bullshit thing, quite frankly. And so I, I always like to try to turn it on myself and, and think of, well, how would I respond to these questions and how would I have when I was in foster care? And, um, and, and, but I write it out in scene so that, uh, the reader can hopefully be engaged with it. And so let's, let's kind of work through it a little bit because I, I just, I, I, I like, breaking these kind of things down and I wonder how you how did you come to the structure of it how you how did you you braided an, uh, a few elements in it and I want to like how did you how did you work through it in your mind and then see it to fruition on the page yeah well uh so you know you the reader hey have you ever read um Ursula Le Guin's The Ones Who Walked Away from Omelas I have not. So Ursula Le Guin wrote a, a short story. It's really short. You can find it online in PDF form. Um, and it's called The Ones Who Walked Away from Omelas. And it's and she go, she begins with this beautiful detail of this sort of utopia where everybody's happy and um, it's beautiful and uh, they get to take non-addictive uh, happiness drugs and, um, play and do uh, and listen to music. And, um, but the only way that this place almost can exist is that there is a child in the basement and, um, and, uh, that is, you know, people go down to the basement every now and again and taunt the child and the child's so disformed and disfigured and malnutrition. You can't tell if it's a boy or a girl or how old it is. And, um, and yet some people choose to walk away from Omelas. And so I learned, I first learned this story, Dorothy Allison taught me it actually. And, um, <laughs> I'll remember when she introduced it, she, she put on her headband and her glasses and she leered at us and she was like, y'all's a bunch of fucking romantics. You have to be, <laughs> to be a writer these days. But her point in the story, she had two points in the story that I, the way I interpret it is one, writers are the ones who walked away from Omelas. But also when it comes to nonfiction, you know, a lot of people, they want to see that you've been to Omelas, but they want to see, you know, they want to see the grime and like the tough stuff, but they want to know that you've made it out of Omelas too. So sometimes, oftentimes I approach nonfiction in the retrospective voice. Like I'm okay. I'm clearly alive now. So I'm telling you in, uh, what happened then, but I'm going to get into the nitty gritty, but I'll be able to like give you a touchstone that I'm okay now so that I've made it out of Omelas. Hmm. What was the most challenging part for you to write the readiness assessment? I mean, I think, 
you know, like I said, I, I struggle with ha- holding a lot of different ideas. And um, what I hear a lot of times is that what I'm writing is more than one essay. So, um, you know, like I said, a, a lot of the feedback I got was like, well, I'm having a hard time because this isn't like a reported piece, but this isn't just a lyrical essay. Like, what is this? You know, you're neither fish nor fowl. And I was just kind of like, it's its its own thing. It's what it wants to be, you know. Um, and I wouldn't be the first person that, that did this, though. I mean, Leslie Jameson in Empathy Exams did this, and Eula Biss does this, you know, where you can use, like, a form and then go into a lyrical essay around the form. But but that was probably the hardest thing is is maybe, like, self-doubt entering in terms of, like, maybe I, maybe I am putting too many different ideas in one thing. But I will say that Proximity did such a beautiful job of of the way that they put actual portions of the assessment in there. I thought that that was so beautiful. Yeah, that was that was kind of that was really neat and, and that layout because it just it stood out in such a way that just it kind of uh, I don't know it, it didn't let your eye get complacent and it was cool to see some of these actual questions that are posed to. Uh, you know, the children and or the kids that are unfortunately starting to age out of the foster care system. So that was, that was really, really well done. What are, what are some common misconceptions about uh, like the group homes and, and foster care um, and the kids living in them for, for people who might not be uh, as familiar with the subject as, as you are for sure. And I know like reading your essay uh, and your story, it was kind of like an introduction to it for me and uh, eye opening in a lot of ways. So I wonder uh, what are some common misconceptions that you've encountered? Well, the greatest misconception is that there's like a big difference between being emancipated and aging out. Like people, uh, I don't know what people think happened to foster kids when, when they get emancipated. I mean, they think that they, I mean, when I was in foster care, you were, would sometimes have like a party and get $200 or a computer and a certificate, maybe some cake, but like, or, you know, and so like these kids are graduating to, um, poverty. And so I, and I think that people saying like, Oh, I was emancipated. Like it's this huge thing. And really for us, it was your birthday that got you emancipated. It wasn't like you went to, um, you, you, you hit any like developmental markers or anything to get emancipated. And now that's more important than ever because the, they extended foster care to 21 and they're going to probably extend it to 25, which is, uh, two things. It's good and bad because like in LA County, if you are an extended foster care, um, that means that you are eligible to continue to receive some financial support. What that amounts to is $775 a month, which is like not enough to live off of in Los Angeles. There's no apartment I've ever heard of. So you have a lot of kids that are there that are graduating again into, uh, into poverty. Mm. And it, because this, it, did, did you find that writing this story was, uh, Harder or easier because it hits so close to the bone? I think easier. Mm-hmm. I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I like uh, being able to have access, emotional access to my stories. And uh, lastly, uh, where, where can people find you online? Uh, MelissaChadburn.com. They can find me and they can find me on Twitter and they can find me on Facebook. What's your Twitter handle? At Melissa Chadburn. Cool. Very nice. Well, I'll let you get going. Um, thank you so much for carving out some time this afternoon. And uh, really well done with the, with the readiness assessment. It was such a, such a great read. And I look forward to reading it again. And uh, like I said, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry that I missed your earlier emails. <laughs> oh, don't, <laughs> oh, don't don't worry about it at all. It's uh, not a problem. We we got it done. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Can I continue success and good luck. Thanks. Bye.